Our next speaker is Dr. Abby Macbeth, who's a research fellow in dermatology. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for asking me to speak today. Um, I'm going to talk to you about lupus, um, the skin and hair. And some of this you may already know, but hopefully you can take away from this some tips and um, some more empowerment as to your, um, your rights as to what you can get through the NHS as well. So just to say, I'm going to mention a few companies during this talk. I have no conflict of interest. I don't get any kickbacks from these companies that I'll mention. And you can all breathe a sigh of relief. I won't be using any clinical images from our clinic. So these are all images from textbooks. So uh, no exposing images there. So that's good. So I'm going to talk about what is skin lupus? Uh, why does it happen? What does it look like? What are the scalp and hair changes? How can it be diagnosed and treated? What could you do as a patient? How can you see a dermatologist and where can you get more information if today's not enough? So what is skin lupus? Well, we would call skin lupus cutaneous lupus erythematosus, like you would call lupus in general systemic lupus erythematosus. And we tend to divide it into two broad ca categories. So systemic lupus with skin features and then skin lupus on its own without systemic disease or internal disease. So um, systemic lupus, about three quarters of people, and many of you here will have skin problems, about three quarters of people with lupus. And unfortunately, about half um, of people with lupus will also have some degree of hair loss. And that may be very mild and, and not noticeable, um, but also up to a more severe degree, which I'll discuss later. <coughs> In terms of skin lupus without internal disease, there's a lot of different types of skin lupus. And um, just to give you an overview of how that then relates to systemic lupus, if you have discoid lupus, which is the most common type, and it's only on the head and neck, the chance of then developing systemic lupus is about one to two out of 100. So about one to two people out of 100 will then go on to develop systemic lupus. If, though, you then get uh, areas on the body, so on the trunk or on the limbs, your chance of then developing systemic lupus goes up to 25% or a quarter of people. So like with systemic lupus, skin lupus is more common in females, 8 to 1, um, and patients are commonly sun sensitive, as many of you will already know, and we would call that photosensitivity. So why does it happen? Um, don't panic, I'm not going to give you a physics lecture, but um, it's the same as in SLE, so it's to do with autoimmunity, um, but we're particularly concerned with UVA and UVB light, and uh, UVA and UVB light can cause damage to skin cells, the keratinocytes, which can then further drive the process, and also UVA and UVB light can also generate further of these chemicals called cytokines, which can then further drive the process of skin lupus. And also, we know that if you do have a lot of sun exposure and you're photosensitive, it can also trigger off a systemic attack of lupus as well. And so it's worth bearing in mind that if you don't have skin lupus, it's always best to protect yourself from the sun anyway. Um, skin lupus can also be triggered by medications, and the list of medications potentially triggering skin lupus are very long. I wouldn't ever recommend stopping a medication without first discussing this with your consultant, um, because it may be that it's coincidental, but there are a few regular culprits that we do come across. So whenever you look at lupus on the internet, you'll probably the first thing you'll come across is this butterfly rash. And this, these are features of um, internal lupus that you'll be familiar with. So this lady here has what we call the butterfly rash. So this might be flat, it might be raised, it's typically red, and usually over the cheeks and across the nose. And this is associated with systemic disease. And so when systemic disease is bad, this is more likely to be bad. Um, but hopefully this will then fade away without leaving a scar. So this falls into the category of, of acute cutaneous lupus. And also here shown some mouth ulcers. And everyone will be familiar with that mouth ulcers are part of the diagnostic criteria. So just to talk a little bit more about um, skin lupus and what it looks like in terms of skin lupus on its own. Well, this is discoid lupus. Um, and that's typically red, it can be itchy, it can be painful, it can be scaly on the top of it. 
And unfortunately, if left untreated, this can then progress and sometimes it can cause scarring and changes in the pigmentation of the skin. And I don't put these pictures up here to worry you, but it's just very important to recognise the early stages to treat to then hopefully prevent the long-term uh, damage that can be caused. So this gentleman at the bottom has pitted scarring around the mouth, um, which can be caused by discoid lupus or a different type called lupus tumidus. And this gentleman with darker type 4 skin um, has changes to do with the pigmentation or colour of the skin. So after skin lupus, you can be left behind with either a darker stain, hyperpigmentation, or a pale mark, hypopigmentation. And uh, these can be covered in various ways that I'll discuss later. Lots of other different types of skin lupus, and I won't be able to go into all of them today, but other ones um, that we tend to see more commonly are subacute cutaneous lupus, shown at the top, and we tend to see rings in the skin, so we would call these annular plaques or rings. Um, they're usually scaly, they might be red, they might be sore, and they're usually in sun-exposed areas, so the V of the neck, um, on the upper back, and around the neck itself. Uh, and also, you'll see here that obviously not every patient that we see has such severe skin lupus, but this is just really to demonstrate what it can look like. You can get very um, sore red plaques, which will then um, go away without scarring. Um, and that's uh, shown up here. So this is more acute cutaneous lupus, as this one is down here. And you can see that this lady has obviously been sunbathing without knowing that she's got lupus. So At the bottom here, this is chillblain lupus. So... Um, you can get uh, changes on the tips of the fingers, tips of the toes, elbows and nose, and this is treated in the same way as systemic lupus and will often, um, as Dr Hall said, go along with systemic activity. Uh, lupus tumidus is, is a rarer variant which is more red but less scaly, but very similar to discoid lupus in the way that it presents. Uh, and lupus paniculitis is we all have a normal fat layer beneath our skin and if that's inflamed with lupus then you can then get dimples in the skin or sort of more general redness which will then need treatment usually with, uh, with tablet treatments rather than cream so it is important to recognise that. So along with the specific lupus rashes, you can get these non-specific rashes which can come along with other conditions as well. And we've sort of touched on a couple of these. But um, so the first image here, this is um, urticaria. So we would say that this is like a nettle rash or wheels. It's very itchy. It's lumpy. It's, um, we would describe it as polymorphic, so it can cause as, as many different shapes as you can think of. And it's not really the shape of it that gives it away. It's the itch and the um, raisedness and the fact that it will come and go within 24 hours but might come up at a different site. Uh, if that then stays for over 24 or 48 hours and starts to resolve with a bruise, it may then be tipping over into what we call urticarial vasculitis, which we then need to take a little bit more seriously. Um, in the middle here, this is vasculitis, so this is small vessel vasculitis. So vasculitis being a swelling around the blood vessels, which will then cause these little blood spots um, called purpura or petechiae. And if you press on them, they're usually on the lower legs, and if you press on them, they don't tend to go away um, when you press. And also you can have other autoimmune skin conditions. So this is vitiligo up at the top here. So this is somebody who has um, their own body is mounting a response to pigment in the skin. And so sometimes you can have other skin conditions which are autoimmune but not necessarily directly related to lupus. So just to talk about hair features, it's difficult to show pictures here because a lot of these features are pretty subtle and it might be you, your hairdresser or your partner or, or family that might notice these changes at first but they're really important to look out for because by getting in early you can then prevent the long-term damage that can sometimes happen. So discoid lupus that we saw on the cheeks of that gentleman there can also happen on the scalp. So the same thing again, itching, redness, um, scaling, and they're usually in the part of the hair or on the top of the head. Um, and if left untreated, these then may scar. So it's important to recognise them early and then they will be treated with steroid creams. Uh, telogen effluvium is a sort of um, a wide-based um, diagnosis, which we usually think of as people who might lose their hair after pregnancy or people who might lose their hair after being particularly ill and being in hospital. This can also sometimes happen in lupus. And it's not a sudden loss of so that everyone would notice that you've lost your hair, but you might find that when you brush your hair that there's a lot more hair on the hairbrush or a lot more hair in the shower. 
um, and also perhaps thinning at the temples. And by noticing this, it's important to then get your doctors to check your iron levels, make sure you've not got any thyroid problems. And if these things are corrected often, then that, that will correct itself. Um, lupus hair, it's a bit of a controversial area, whether or not this exists is an open debate, but um, there's been described uh, short and unruly hair at the front hairline, and usually that's um, in people who have had a lot of trouble with systemic or internal lupus. So I'm not trying to worry anybody, but it's important just to note that it's really good to get in there early with treatment. Um, this gentleman here has had discoid lupus, and you can see that there's this, still this redness and scale like we saw on the cheek of that other gentleman. But in the middle now, he's now got this shiny white area where unfortunately the hair will then not be able to regrow, and that's scarring. But had that been treated earlier with strong steroids or steroid injections, that could have been prevented. And this is also in a, a gentleman with type 5 skin uh, showing the same thing, but also showing that pigment change, which can also happen on the scalp as well. Uh, this lady at the bottom here is showing you in her, the palm of her hand the amount of hair that she's lost in a day. And so that might not be noticeable to you. She's got nice long hair, um, but to her that can be very worrying. And what we say to people with telogen effluvium is it doesn't matter how many times you brush your hair or wash your hair or have your hair coloured, um, it won't change the amount of hair that falls out, it will just make you feel better about your hair. So don't worry about doing any of those things if you do find you have uh, a higher fall of hair. And this lady at the bottom has, um, has lupus hair. It's very, one of the very few pictures that I could find, but I think you can tell that this lady has a butterfly rash and she's obviously been quite unwell wearing a hospital gown. So. So how would we diagnose um, skin and hair lupus? Well, as you can tell from what I've said so far, um, a lot of it comes down to chatting with you and having a look at your hair and having a look at your skin in general, getting the clues that we can. But sometimes we might use this thing called a dermatoscope here, which um, is a special type of polarised light with a magnifying glass on. And we can look much closer and look at the hairs with that. Um, we might sometimes do a hair pull test, which sounds a bit mean, but we grab 60 hairs and try and give them a little tug. And if more than six come out, that might make us think about telogen effluvium. This here at the end is um, a skin biopsy. So sometimes if we can't put all the pieces of the jigsaw together, and often if they're scarring, we'll ask for a little biopsy. So either two from the scalp or one from the body. And we do that under local anaesthetic. It takes about 20 minutes to half an hour, one or two stitches. You can go home straight away afterwards. But that will give a lot of information about what's going on in the skin and give a bit of f further evidence to know that we're going in the right direction and it's okay to go on to more heavy duty treatments. And these then complement the blood tests, so the ANA or the Rho and La double-stranded DNA. And also sometimes a trial of treatment is the only real way that we'll know um, you know, whether or not this is lupus. So sometimes just a short course of steroids can tell us if it will switch it off. So how can it be treated? Well, I'll talk a little bit more about sun protection, and probably a lot of people here already know what I'm going to say, but um, just a refresher and to tell you what you can get on the NHS. Um, good general skin care. So it, dermatologists don't recommend washing your skin with soap or shower gel. Uh, usually we would recommend that you wash your skin with a moisturiser. So something like Diprobase or Zerobase that you can get from your doctor if you have skin trouble. A couple of pumps of that under warm water, rub your hands together and you can use it to wash. It will clean the skin, but it won't strip the skin of its natural oils. And also uh, it can be used as a moisturiser or a greasier moisturiser like Hydromol. Um, steroid creams is one of the few indications for using a strong steroid cream on the face. A lot of um, doctors and patients are understandably concerned about using strong steroid creams on the face, but with lupus, because as we've seen from the pictures, it's a bit heaped up and scaly, and we're concerned that if we leave it untreated, it may leave a scar, we're quite happy to go in there with the big guns, so with moderate potent or very potent steroids that we wouldn't otherwise use, and that's pretty safe. Alternatively, we can use some different types of creams, and these ones, um, like Protopic, uh, damp down the immune system in a slightly different way, but don't thin the skin, and they can be quite helpful. We've talked about hydroxychloroquine. That's then our next line, so usually we might even start these at the same time, the hydroxychloroquine with the steroid creams, um, and that can be really helpful. That's a, an anti-malarial, as you might know. I've put steroid tablets in brackets. We try and minimise the amount of steroids that you receive, but sometimes it's um, important to just get that diagnosis or to get um, bad skin lupus under control quite quickly. 
And there's a lot of discussion about what will be the next line after that, the next line of treatment. And uh, a recent survey across eight UK centres found that there were 21 different agents used in this scenario by different dermatologists. So there's obviously a lot of disagreement, but we might use some other antimalarials, usually in combination with hydroxychloroquine um, and some of the other uh, agents that we've discussed earlier. And also, it sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but you can also use a very um, tight band of UVA called UVA1, which can sometimes be beneficial as well, because um, that can damp down the immune system whilst not giving you the, the harmful parts of UV. And rituximab and bilimumab, um, Dr. James already touched upon these, and uh, these have been shown in some case reports and case series to be useful, but have not yet been shown in good quality studies, so hopefully that will be coming soon. So what can you do? I'm just going to talk about these few things um, and tell you what you're entitled to. So sunscreen. So on the NHS, if you're photosensitive, so if you're sensitive to the sun, you are entitled to sun cream on prescription, and it should be factor 50. Um, so the numbers give you the UVB and the stars give you the UVA. So the sun protection factor UVB is the amount of times that you can sit longer without getting burnt. Obviously, we don't want you to sit out, but that's just to give you an indication that factor 50 is 50 times longer. You can be out in the sun without causing damage. <coughs> So you want factor 50 plus or five stars, and the government have just legislated that we, they also need to place on the bottle now whether it's high or very high protection and UVA in a circle. So you don't, in some creams, don't need to look at the stars anymore because the UVA in a circle means that it's got as good, if not better, UVA protection than UVB. So as long as it says very high protection, UVA in a circle or UV or factor 50 plus and five stars, that's great. So you might be wondering why there's a picture of Crocodile Dundee. It's just to remind me that there's also a preparation you can get from dermatologists called Dundee Cream. So if you're allergic... <laughs> I could have put a picture of Dundee, but um, if you're allergic to any of the components in sunscreens, this is just a reflective sunscreen. It's quite thick, it's difficult to apply, but it does come in different colours, and it is a bit like a thick foundation. But if you are allergic to components in sun cream, that's quite a useful thing to know about. But it does cost about £200 per prescription, so we don't, we don't give that lightly. <laughs> um, Changing Faces have recently taken over what the Red Cross used to provide, which is a camouflage service. Now, um, camouflage creams are also available on the NHS. So if you have pigment disturbance or scarring related to lupus, you are entitled to um, Dermablend or Veil or Covermark on prescription. And this is unisex for men, for women. It can be used in children. Also, it has factor 30 or above in each of these creams, so then you don't need to worry about, oh, where am I going to put my sun cream? Which one shall I put on first? They've got sunblock in them and you can refer yourself so you can go onto this website which I'll show you now changing faces and if you go up to the top here um, skin camouflage if you click on that there's then a referral form and you can refer yourself or you can ask your dermatologist or any doctor in hospital to do that for you and somebody will sit down with you color match your skin talk you through how to best apply it and um, it can be really helpful I've had a lot of good feedback about this service so if you do have scarring or changes in pigmentation then I would recommend that UV window film, you might already know about this, but at home or in the office, it's something you can do, which means that you don't need to then keep reapplying your sunblock during the day. Usually we recommend that sunblock's reapplied every two to three hours, but if you're sitting in an office, you're right by a window, you can ask your employer to put some UV protective film on the windows. Um, it's colourless, or you can get tints if you particularly want tinted windows on your house, but um, you also, you can then use these in the car. But what we recommend is that this is done by a professional car installer because the government are pretty strict about what colour it is, how dark it is, especially in front of the post on, on the driver's side. You don't need to put it on the windscreen. That's already UV filtered, so the, your windscreen is already protected. You don't need to worry about that. And the thing to note is that the, the sort of guards that you would get for children, the sunscreens, they're not particularly useful. They can let sunlight through, and so they're not very helpful. The best thing to do is to get a professional installer to put this film on the windows for you. And an example of that is Dermaguard. And one of the tips for you is that if you are unfortunately admitted to hospital, there should be side rooms in the hospital that have UV film on the windows. So if you ask when you go in, they may be able to locate that for you. This goes back to the days when we were allowed to actually admit people under dermatology, so uh, we're not allowed to anymore. But, uh, so um, yeah, there should be a room. If not, as far away from the windows you can get. 
protective clothing. So um, many of you may already have hats. I did a little bit of a hat count as people were walking in. I don't know if anyone noticed, but uh, there were only a few actually. So we say March to October. That means the beginning of March to the end of October. And if not, also over winter as well. So you can get winter hats as well. Um, Tilly San Diego hats are factor 50 plus. There are other hats obviously that you can get as long as it says factor 50 plus on it. Tightly woven clothes. If you hold up your clothing to the light and you can see light through it, it's not tightly woven enough. And if you want further reassurance, factor 50 plus clothing is available and sunglasses as well. And to know that. Um, we in Norwich have done some tests and <laughs> apparently a factor uh, a t-shirt normal white t-shirt that you might just buy from any shop is factor 10 and if it gets wet if you go swimming on holiday it's actually only factor 6 so it's really important to know that's worth getting good quality uv protection clothing uh, we've been asked quite a lot recently about light bulbs, um, and I'm not sure if you know this already, but some light bulbs can emit some types of UVA. Um, and so the best light bulbs to go for are incandescent old-fashioned bulbs, if you can find them anywhere or if you've still got some at home, or double-wrapped light bulbs that look like old-fashioned light bulbs. <laughs> so they've got the coil inside and then they've got that extra coating on the outside that looks like a normal light bulb. The ones to avoid, if you can, are these at the bottom with the coil, um, and also, if you can get a UV guard for any fluorescent tubing, you can get those on the internet as well. So, um, tragically, one day I took a light meter home with me to test all my light bulbs, and mine don't emit UVA, and I've actually got quite a few different types of energy saving bulbs at home, but there will be, if you're having a lot of trouble with the skin lupus and you can't find out why, then it's probably worthwhile just replacing all of your bulbs, especially at work if you're sitting under fluorescent tubing as well. <coughs> So how can you see a dermatologist? Well, you can ask your GP to refer you directly, or you can ask your consultant to refer um, that you see in your normal clinic, or we also run joint clinics. So I'm in Dr. Jane's Tuesday clinic, and also there's a joint clinic run in Norwich, and also there's lots of other clinics around the country where dermatologists, rheumatologists, and nephrologists work together. So you can ask to be referred to one of those clinics. These are areas where you can get further information. Um, I can't recommend any other information that you can get on the internet. Obviously, Lupus UK has got a great website and links through to Eclipse, all about sun protection. The British Association of Dermatologists, lots of information in terms of word leaflets. But if you'd like some pictures, then the one that I can recommend is Dermnet NZ. That's a New Zealand dermatology society. Lots of images on there if you're wondering whether you need to, to consult your doctor about anything. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you.